Welcome to the Nature of Teaching Professional Development webinar series. My name is Rod Williams. I'm a professor and extension wildlife specialist with Purdue Extension. Today's webinar is entitled Connecting Youth to Wildlife. This will be a 30 minute webinar covering the benefits of connecting our youth with wildlife. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this topic, this webinar is going to provide you with science based background information to prepare you for all remaining webinars associated with youth, wildlife, and nature. Well, joining me today is my great friend and colleague, Jared Brook. Jared is an extension wildlife specialist with Purdue, as well as a co-author on many of the educational materials associated with wildlife. Jared's gonna be highlighting key concepts and ways to connect our youth with wildlife. And then I'll finish the webinar by highlighting additional resources and the procedure you need to use to obtain your certification of completion. So Jared, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to you and we'll get started and I'll let you uh, talk about wildlife and its uh, impacts on your youth. Thanks, Rod. I appreciate that. And thanks for the introduction. Um, and so in my role here at Purdue, I do a lot of education centered around wildlife and not only youth education, but also adult education, talking to the public, talking to landowners and things. And that's all centered around wildlife. Um, so wildlife is really important to me and thinking about how we can connect people to wildlife is, is also really um, important to me. And that all starts with connecting wild or connecting youth to wildlife and to, and to nature. So I'm sure many of you can think back to your childhood and some of those foundational memories you have out in nature. I certainly can. And those memories and events and experiences outdoors in nature is ultimately what led me to the career that I chose being a wildlife biologist. So again, connecting youth to nature and to wildlife is, is really important. And we're gonna kind of dive into the nuts and bolts about um, thinking kind of strategically about how we connect youth to nature and then about how the nature of teaching resources can fit into that connection between youth and nature and wildlife. So just to kind of start with some background things here. So I want you to kind of think about how kids are learning about nature today. If you think about that, I kind of already put it up there on the screens, but most of the time I would say that most kids learn about nature through nature uh, educational programming, TV, things like Discovery Kids or National Geographic Kids, or by visiting zoos. Um, and those are certainly can be good ways to learn about nature. Um, but if you think about how maybe youth learned about nature 50 years ago, or how you learned about nature and wildlife when you were younger, I would imagine that it's, it's really drastically different. Um, I think even my experiences growing up, being immersed in nature, being allowed to go down to the creek behind my house by myself and with my friends exploring nature, that's probably a lot different than the environment that kids are growing up in today and how they're interacting and learning about nature. So um, I think it's important to think about the ways that youth learn about nature and learn about wildlife and maybe look at some of the pros and cons of, of those different ways. So if we think about um, using television and nature television about ways, about learning about nature, or as ways to learn about nature, they can certainly have their positive benefits. Some of those positive benefits may be that uh, kids are exposed to environments and animals and things that they never would have saw or seen in their own backyard or own environment without traveling and things like that. So they get a wider view of the diversity and biodiversity and ecosystems that's throughout the world. However, there is maybe some downsides to um, learning about nature solely through things like nature television, you know, Discovery Kids or International Ge Geographic Kids. And to look at one study that kind of looked at this, um, there was a study in 2014 that looked at kids' understanding of the environment, their environmental knowledge, and the relationship between those kids that watch nature television. And what they found was that actually that 
kids who watched more nature television actually had a lower environmental knowledge. And that may sound really counterintuitive. And it's not to say that watching nature television isn't a good thing to learn about nature, but what they thought in their study was that kids who were watching nature television were probably also watching more television in general and spending less time in nature. So maybe they didn't have that connection, that experiential connection to nature. They were only really watching um, things about nature, not actually out exploring nature. So that's maybe why they found that negative relationship. But if we think about how kids are learning about nature today, compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago, what might be some down, a downside to learning about nature through TV or visiting zoos? I can think of uh, a couple reasons. Kind of the first one being that if we think about the content that you get when you're um, watching nature television or you're visiting a zoo, most of the animals and the things that they highlight are charismatic species that you might find in Africa, things like lions, elephants, or even things uh, like tigers, some of those bigger, more charismatic species that are more commonly known. But they don't show kind of the, the wildlife species that we may find in our backyard, some of our more local wildlife species that may be just as imperiled or just as endangered as some of those species that you might find on other con continents. And while it's not a bad thing that they are learning about these species on other continents, it may become problematic if they're learning about those species at the expense of learning about species that they may find here in the United States or here right in their own backyard. Um, and I say that because if you think about it, there may not be that connection to nature, or you may think that nature is something you would find, or wildlife is something you would find in another continent, not something you would find here in the United States. Um, but certainly zoos and, and aquariums and things like that are doing a much better job these days about highlighting local biodiversity and local wildlife species. I mean, you can go to various zoos and see exhibits um, with wildlife species you would find right here in Indiana as well. And I know you may hear more about it, but some of the zoos here in Indiana now have um, displays and environmental education surrounding the Eastern Hellbender, which we'll talk about here in a minute, which is an endangered species in Indiana um, that is also you know, one of the largest salamanders in the world. So a really cool species we have here in Indiana that you know, until recently wasn't really highlighted as a conservation or species of conservation concern at things like zoos. Another um, downside to learning about nature through TV and zoos is that they may not be an effective way of establishing a connection to nature. So we looked at that study earlier, but there's all kinds of studies that go to say that basically the more time you spend in nature, the more experiences you have in nature, the more you'll care about nature and care about the environment. So learning about nature through TV and through the internet and things like that may not foster that deep connection to nature that some of those more experiential um, learning opportunities may. Things like 4-H or things like Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and, and such or going camping. So those may be some of the kind of the, the downsides to only learning about nature through TV or through visiting zoos. Uh, and like we talked about, one of those downsides may be you kind of overlook some of the awesome biodiversity that we have here in Indiana and in the United States um, by learning only about species that occur on different continents. And to kind of show you some of those and kind of really drive this point home, I put up four species of wildlife that we have in North America here and have in the United States, three of which we would find in Indiana and one of which we wouldn't. But I kind of put these up there to kind of sh highlight, these are some of my kind of favorite species, species that I really like and I think have some really interesting facts about them. So that species there in the top left, which is right here, um, that is a rainbow darter. 
And we have all kinds of different darter species in Indiana. And in fact, um, darters, most of the darters are um, endemic to the Eastern United States. And when we talk about biodiversity, the state in the Eastern United States that has the highest biodiversity of freshwater fish like these dart darters is actually Alabama. There are all, all kinds of darter species throughout um, the Southeast and Eastern United States. They're really cool species. They're called darters because they dart really fast after um, fish and their prey and they live in a lot of small streams. And so we can go out to a stream that we have here in West Lafayette and we can find these rainbow darters, we can find orange-throated darters, Johnny darters, all kinds of different species. They're really cool um, and the amazing colors and things they have rival a lot of those species you would find in the Amazon or in um, some of the African rivers and streams. So really cool species. The next one on the top right there is one I mentioned earlier, Eastern Hellbender. So it's the uh, third largest salamander in the world. Um, and it's a, a species that Rod does a lot of research on. It's endangered in the state of Indiana um, and only found in the eastern United States and found in one river here in Indiana. So it's a really cool species. Talk about prehistoric. That species has been around for, all, for millions of years. Um, and it's a really cool species. One that's obviously of conservation concern and one that we're at risk of losing, uh, but one that a lot, not a lot of people know about or know we even have in Indiana. This bird down here on the left is a northern shrike. And it's a really cool bird that has some really cool ecology with it. Um, it is called a butcher bird. And the butcher, it's called a butcher bird because it actually catches its prey and impales its prey on thorns barbed wire and other things like it has this um, songbird here. So it has to have, live in areas that have trees with, with thorns or barbed wire or other things so that it can impale and, and eat its prey. But again, a bird that's also in decline in Indiana and there's not that many of them that actually breed in the state, but a really cool one that has kind of a unique life history about it. Probably one of my favorite ones, not one that we have here in Indiana, you have to go farther west to find it, is this right here. This is the pronghorn, often ca times called um, pronghorn antelope, but it is actually not an antelope, and it's actually more closely related to, to a giraffe than it is um, to the antelopes of, of Africa and other places. It's the, actually the only species that's left in its genus. There used to be all kinds of species of pronghorn that were um, roaming the plains of North America during the Pleistocene, back when we had all kinds of really cool wildlife species like woolly mammoths, um, short-faced bears, ground sloths, and American cheetah. And that's also a reason why people think that um, pronghorn are so fast. They're the fastest land man, mammal at sustained distances. So they're not as quick as a cheetah is in a sprint, but they can run faster for a longer distance than a cheetah can. And so the thought is that these species, the pronghorn evolved on the Great Plains with American cheetahs. And so they had to evolve to become that fast. So they can run a really fast distance for a, a really long time period and a really cool species that's been here in North America for tens of thousands of years. Uh, so really an, another vestige of the past. But I say all that just to say that these are some really cool species that we have and some really cool biodiversity that we have in North America that may sometimes be overlooked um, and not thought of when we talk about teaching about wildlife and nature. So why do I think that, you know, there's maybe an issue that there's a disconnect from local nature? And I think this is kind of backed up with some different studies. There was a study that looked at um, the ability of Minnesota fifth graders to name native wildlife species, and they could only name four or less species that they would find on their school grounds, even though you know there's hundreds of species of wildlife that is native to Indiana or native to Minnesota. 
And when asked to describe a wildlife species, only about half of the students described a local wildlife species in this study, whereas 25% um, percent described an exotic species. And those tended to be things like lions, tigers, and, and elephants, some of those charismatic megafauna. The other 25% either described a domestic species or didn't describe a species at all. So just to go to show you that there may be you know, a fair amount of students that really don't know the biodiversity that is in their local area. Um, when asked to list five wildlife species, 89% of North Carolina students could list five global wildlife species, but could only list, about 65% of them could list five species they would find in North Carolina. And kind of the, the kicker to all this, the last study, the one that kind of hurts my heart the most is that when asked, students could correctly identify Pokemon species 80% of the time, but only identify native wildlife species 53% of the time. So I don't know if that means that we need to create a wildlife Pokemon game, but it kind of shows you that students' um, understanding of native wildlife species may be lacking. So why is connecting youth to wildlife and nature important? Well, I think it's really summed up in these two quotes here. Um, the first one by Baba Daum, who's a Senegalese forest engineer. And he said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we're taught. So if we're not taught, or we don't know anything about these native wildlife species, our willingness to conserve and fight for these species is gonna be severely diminished. And the next quote's also a really good one. And this is from a, um, an author, Otto Leopold, who was also a conservationist and is considered the father of wildlife management. He wrote in 1949 that we grieve only for what we know. Erasure of sylphium, and sylphium is a genus of prairie plants from Western Dane County, Wisconsin, it's only cause for grief if one knows it only as a name in a botany book. So basically saying that if we don't connect to nature and we don't have an understanding for it and identify these different plant and wildlife species out in nature, then it's not going to be a big deal if those um, species go away or we're not going to really care about it. I think kind of a good case in point is, is the Eastern Hellbender, right? And so we talked about how it's endangered. Um, not a lot of people know about it. So if it, if it becomes extinct, only the people that know about it and understand the species that it is will really care. So we need to really highlight some of those important concepts and species in nature and wildlife to, to make sure that people care about what's right there in their backyard so that they'll be willing to conserve it and conserve our environment. Um, and when we talk about ways that we can connect youth to nature, why it's important, one of the things that um, always comes up is having those experiences in nature and how important those experiences in, nature's are, in, in nature are. And I think this kind of study that was done in 2017 kind of highlights how those experiences in nature relate to people's understanding of nature. And so what they did was they looked at students um, in North Carolina and actually how much hunting experience those students had, whether their family hunted or they hunted. And they found that those with more hunting experience also had a better knowledge of the biodiversity in their local area. And that's not to say that we have to take out every student hunting in order to understand nature and wildlife. But what I think it does show is that because those students we're spending more time in the woods out in nature than other students. They had a better understanding and appreciation for that biodiversity. And that can even follow through into the adult years. There was a study um, done looking at hunters, bird watchers, and those people that consider themselves hunters and bird watchers as adults. Those people that identified it in those categories were more likely to to participate in pro-conservation behaviors, meaning they're more willing to spend their money and their time fighting for nature and fighting for wildlife compared to 
someone who doesn't hunt or someone who doesn't bird watch or spend much time in nature. Um, and we can even think about how those previous experience in nature and knowledge of the environment are correlated with pro-environmental behaviors. So the more time that, that young people spend out in nature, the more they're knowledgeable about nature and the more that they're gonna care about nature and about the environment. So we're really kind of seeding, sowing the seeds for a foundation of environmental responsibility. But it also depends on kind of how students interact with nature um, as to how that fits in with a relationship of nature. So this study looked at different ways that, that um, youth interacted with nature, nature and what impact that had on their willingness to participate in pro-environmental behaviors. That'd be things like recycling, um, caring about the environment and so on. They kind of classify these into two different categories. They had what they called wild nature experiences. And those would be things like going camping, going hiking, fishing, hunting, where you're really immersed in nature for a long period of time versus what they called domesticated um, experiences. And those were really um, things like planting flowers, planting a tree, um, tending a garden, where you're out doing things in nature, but you're not quite as immersed. And what they found was those, while both experiences led to pro-environmental behaviors, those wild ones were really important in kind of setting that foundation for caring about the environment um, and environmental awareness. We spent some time talking about why we think connecting youth with nature and wildlife and teaching about nature and wildlife is important. Now we need to kind of put that in context to see how environmental education and you as youth educators fit into that, um, that relationship. So we think about how does environmental education fit in? Well, it's a perfect avenue to connect students to local environmental or conservation issues. And one of the kind of case in points is all the issues that are going on with our pollinator communities, right? So we've lost a lot of our pollinator communities. Um, their populations are declining, bees, butterflies, and things like that. So there's a big concerted, concerted effort to increase the amount of pollinator habitat um, as well as pollinators on the landscape. So that's a perfect way to kind of tie in a, a local, it's, it's a local environmental and conservation issue, but it's also a global environmental and conservation issue. But we can tie that in with things like native plants, talking about how important plants that are native to this area, to Indiana and the Midwest and other parts of the, the country, how important those native plants are to our native pollinator communities. So taking that one step down the ladder, how do we think school ground fits in? Well, school grounds are the perfect opportunity um, to get students out into nature often, right? And talk about some of these concepts. And there's some the research to back up the importance that school grounds play in learning about nature and wildlife. And so one study looked at the fact that participation in these schoolyard activities actually strengthened the results of some of the education that were going on, that was going on in the classroom. So taking some of those concepts that are being learned in the classroom um, and actually strengthening those by giving them hands-on examples out in nature can actually reinforce the, that learning. It gives you the perfect opportunity to highlight local biodiversity. What's more local than finding the wildlife species and plant species that are native and found in your own schoolyard. And probably the most important factor overall is that it provides the ability to provide frequent, repeated, and sustained experiences in nature. And those are kind of the three key ingredients to making nature education impactful and last um, in the eyes of the students. So how do you take a student and actually help them develop these pro-environmental behaviors? Well, it's really through frequent, repeated and sustained experiences in nature. So where does the nature of teaching wildlife fit in? Well, it's a standards-based curriculum 
that can be simply incorporated into the already required curriculum. So we hit on a lot of the state standards so that we know that it can be incorporated into your curriculum that's already required. It provides a mixture of indoor and outdoor nature-based lesson plans, which is very helpful in kind of reinforcing some of the concepts that are being learned in the classroom. Um, the outdoor activities that we have can be performed on most school properties. So you don't have to take students to, you know, a, a natural area that's 20 miles down the road. You can do most of the stuff right in the back yard of your school property. Um, and a lot of it is actually focused on local, state, and regional biodiversity. So really honing in on what are some conservation and biodiversity issues that we're facing here in Indiana, in the Midwest, and within the United States. So thinking about how the nature of teaching wildlife fits in. So what does the nature of teaching wildlife have to offer you as an educator? Um, well, we, we have a lot of curriculum and this, this slide actually needs to be updated, but we have over seven units that have multiple lesson plans. We have more than six standalone lesson plans. And I think we're up to now more than 30 total lesson plans um, that are centered on wildlife and nature. Just to kind of go through some of those lesson plans, the first unit is animal diversity and tracking, which is actually five lesson plans. It hits on K through five science and math, and there's the objectives there. Um, unit two is mammal food web, talking all about feeding habits, trophic levels, and a food web, and, and all the things involved in food webs. It also hits on K to five science. We have one that hits on reptiles, amphibians, and the scientific method, which is uh, a really lesson plan that's, that's downloaded a lot because it really helps incorporate that scientific method. It has three lesson plans. It also it hits on K through five math, science, and English standards. We have a unit all about mammals and their ecosystem that they live in. Um, hits on science, language, and math as well. We have a unit that's all about plant succession and how plant communities change over time. Um, and how the use of things like prescribed fire can affect that plant succession or the change in plant communities over time. We have one of our newest lesson plans is uh, a series of hikes or scavenger hunts that incorporate ideas about, about habitat and habitat quality and how that's related to wildlife abundance and diversity. Um, and that hits on K through five reading, writing, math, and science. We also have some lesson plans that are more advanced that um, talk that are more like middle school, high school lessons. This one in particular talks about conservation biology, um, using literature to talk about factors that are threatening a species and, and so on. We have one that's all about um, forest management. I'm sure some of you have heard of the term clear cut um, that can be used in, in negative ways or positive ways. Um, but this one actually uses data from a research project here at Purdue to look at how um, timber harvest affects forest birds. So how does biodiversity and diversity of birds change following um, timber harvest? We have some newer lesson plans also that are all about disease ecology and ecotoxicology and environmental health, as well as we have some standalone lesson plans we have a Mammals of Indiana guide that talks about several common species of Indiana mammals and gives you all kinds of facts about them. Um, an Ecolapse lesson plan that's essentially Jenga with ecosystems. So as you remove parts of the ecosystem, the ecosystem collapses. Another lesson plan that's about um, animal coloration. Lesson plans that are about the watershed and how human impacts Human, how humans impact water quality, some that are about more about water quality, and then some that are about specific wildlife species like um, Eastern hellbenders. We also have um, lesson plans about invasive species and about adaptations that aquatic amphibians 
amphibians have to thrive and survive in their environment. So lots of lesson plans that are focused on a whole host of natural resources, wildlife topics um, that are at your disposal, free for you to download and utilize in your classroom. All right, thanks, Jared. Uh, so I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us for the Nature of Teaching Professional Development webinar entitled Connecting Youth with Wildlife. I hope you consider participating in the remaining webinars associated with wildlife to find out how to incorporate all of those lesson plans that Jared just highlighted for you into your classroom. Now, if you enjoyed this webinar, I encourage you to click on the card that should now be showing off in the right uh, top portion of your screen to visit our Nature of Teaching YouTube channel. Here you can view sneak peeks of lesson plans that are directly related to the, the wildlife lessons that Jared just highlighted. Uh, now, if you're having a difficult time with the card that just showed up in the top right of your screen, I've embedded the YouTube channel URL here in this PowerPoint slide for you. Or if you're in YouTube, you can simply search the Nature of Teaching in the YouTube search bar to find our sneak peeks. Now these sneak peek videos are two minutes or less and they really focus on describing those activities in each of the lessons as a way to, to show you what the lesson is about and help you figure out and determine whether or not you want to incorporate that into your classroom. Now, if you're interested in getting your certificate of completion for this 30 minute webinar, there should now be a second card that's visible in the top right of your screen here you'll be directed to a short Qualtrics survey that will provide us some feedback on the, on the program you just watched. Uh, once you complete that short Qualtrics survey, you'll automatically be emailed your certification of completion. And again, if you're having a difficult time with the card, I've embedded the URL for that Qualtrics survey for you here. Uh, again, as soon as you complete that short survey, you'll get your certification of completion. So Jared, if I could get you to come back and join us, I wanted to again thank you. Uh, so thanks for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today. And I was wondering, Jared, if, if people have additional questions about wildlife and how to connect youth with wildlife or any of the curriculum that we have, uh, do you mind if folks reach out to you for answers? Absolutely. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or help um, you know, address any wildlife related issues you may have and, and help you connect your youth that you teach to to wildlife and to nature. And you can reach me at my email address there that's um, on the screen. Uh, also uh, want to uh, reiterate, if you have questions about the certification of completion, uh, you'll just need to address me uh, directly through the email rodw at purdue.edu and I'll be able to address any of those questions that you may have. So on behalf of me and Jared and everyone on the Nature of Teaching team, we hope you enjoyed learning with us today and consider participating in additional professional development webinars offered by our team. Until then, thank you for engaging our youth with nature. Until next time.